this, uh, this, this is not a Christmas message. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, I want to just share a, a few words with you. It's, it's kind of the closing remarks, uh, wrapping up the gospel of Mark. Uh, the point that I want to drive home tonight is that all four of the gospels uh, give us uh, details concerning the Lord's ministry uh, and his, his life here on earth. Um, some are more detailed than others uh, about his birth. Some are more detailed than others uh, about uh, his death. But all in all, they, uh, they give us a picture of his life and ministry and it gives us it gives us a very clear uh, pattern. I guess it's the best word to say. A very clear pattern by which we should pattern our lives and our church services. Uh, so in beginning, I want to start in verse 11. It says, And they, when they heard that he was alive, had, and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them, as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told unto the under the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at me, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> by way of introduction, Jesus is risen. Uh, this is, this is uh, immediately after he is risen. Uh, the resurrection has at least now been announced, and Mark's account shows him as having appeared to Mary Magdalene. And now Mary goes and tells the disciples. Uh, actually, back up a couple verses in verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and, and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. <clears throat> now, sometimes, sometimes we kind of chide the disciples for their unbelief. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to get a creep in my neck because there's just, just a couple of you on this side. Everybody's bunched up over here. Uh, <clears throat> but at, at any rate, uh, you know, we kind of, sometimes we kind of chide them for their unbelief. Uh, because Jesus had told them what was going to happen and how he would rise again on the third day. Uh, we go back to chapter 8 of Mark in verse 31. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. <clears throat> now, uh, we had a member here uh, that used to say plain talk is easy understood. And, and it just simply cannot get any plainer than this. Jesus said, he told them, I'm going to uh, suffer many things. I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the priests. And I'm, and I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to rise again. So, you know... We, we, we sometimes we, we say, you know, what's with them that they couldn't listen? But uh, 
don't we sometimes do the same things? I mean, think about it. We read in the scriptures to watch and pray. Uh, we read that we should seek first the kingdom of God. And, and we read that temporal things will perish. And how do we respond? Well, pretty much the same way they did. Uh, this is real life. We've got to get on with our business. Uh, we respond sort of like they did. Uh, you know, they, they said, they said uh, Mary said, he's risen. They said, we don't believe it. Uh, when they heard, they didn't believe. Uh, Luke's account tells us that there were other women with Mary Magdalene uh, when they told the apostles. So there was more than one witness, which was a Jewish requirement. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 10, it says, it, says uh, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. So Luke's account uh, simply says uh, there was plenty of witnesses there that said he's risen. He's risen. Uh, uh, Luke's account goes on to say that it was the 11 apostles who were gathered together uh, in, in verse 9 uh, of, of Luke chapter 24. Uh, a casual reading of that would make us think, well, you know, Judas is gone. Uh, but when we, when we read a little closer, we see John, uh, John chapter 20 and verse 24 says it was Thomas who was called Didymus who was not there. Uh, Thomas, John chapter 20 and verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time commenting on that. You've heard me talk about it before. I personally believe that Judas left the band uh, at the ascension when he finally realized I have betrayed the Son of God. Uh, but at any rate, uh, after after this, it tells us in our text. It, in our text, verse 12 says. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Well, this would be Cleophas and another unnamed disciple that was on the road to Emmaus. Uh, again, in Luke's, Luke's account, in Luke chapter uh, 24, verse 14, actually it goes through verse 33, but I'm not going to read all of that. Uh, I will read through verse 17 just so we get an idea of what's, what, 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 who's being talked about. And it says that they talked together of all these things which had happened. It came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communication are these that ye, that ye have one another as you walk and are sad? Uh, and you know, apparently then, they returned back to Jerusalem and they told what they'd seen. They didn't believe them either. Uh, you know, uh, verse 13 simply says, They went and told unto the residue, and neither believed they them. Afterward... <laughs> Continuing on in our text in Mark chapter 16, afterward, verse 14, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, <clears throat> Y'all have to catch me. Have to bear with me. I have to catch my breath every now and then. I'm, I'm really short of breath uh, for a while now. <clears throat> but as, as we look, he's, it, it, he appears to them, and he and he begins to he begin. It's his upbraid. He was really giving them a tongue lashing. Why couldn't you believe? What they've told you because you know what I said. I told you this was going to happen. And now they've come along and said it's happened and you didn't believe it. Uh, when, when we look at this word upgrade, he was, he was, he was giving them a real tongue lash for, for their unbelief. I mean, we find other places where he has upbraided uh, during his ministry where it used the word upbraided and it was very
obvious that he was he was laying it he was laying it out to him on the line, and he was laying it out to him on the line here. But then after that, good thing about this is <clears throat> Jesus will correct us. But after he's corrected us, his love shows through. <laughs> Uh, he went right straight from his, his upbraiding them for their unbelief and hardness of heart right into the Great Commission. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, it's... I see in this... I see in this commission... Something that Jesus really wanted us to understand. Really wanted us to know uh, that we're to be spreading the gospel. I say that because, you know, the, the, we had the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in each of them, they give a little different aspect of the Lord's life and His ministry. Some of them overlap their stories of things that happened during his ministry. Some of them weren't. Some of them had, some of them had uh, stories that were very unique to just that, to just that gospel. But it was because it was, well, it's been a while since I've told you this, so I'll get to tell you again. Well, it, it was because each of them was portraying a, a, a little different side of the Lord and was, and was talking to a different specific group of people. Uh, Matthew was speaking primarily just to the Jews. Now, we really like Matthew because uh, it has the best rendition of the Great Commission. But... Matthew was talking to Jews and he was saying, look, this is the king that we've waited for. Uh, Mark, was, Mark was writing, uh, well, Mark was writing primarily to the Romans. And Mark, even though it's one of the shorter books, has more miracles in it than, than any of the others because he was showing Jesus as a powerful, get-things-done leader. Uh, Luke was writing to the Gentiles. Luke's the only Gentile writer, and he was writing to Gentiles. Actually, uh, when, when we look at it, he was writing to a specific person. But nonetheless... He was writing to the Gentiles. John, on the other hand, presented Jesus simply as the Son of God. He presented him as the. You know, he began his gospel with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And yet, although each one of these are individual, uh, portray individual sides of the Lord, all four of them present some form of the Great Commission. Matthew's account is the most quoted because it's the clearest instructions concerning the commission. Matthew uh, 8, uh, 28, 18 through 20, uh, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, or always, even unto the end of the world. Luke's account is a little shorter. Luke sa he says unto them, Luke chapter 24, verse 46, he says unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. That's Luke's rendition. Uh, 
we saw March, we just got through reading March, so I'll skip it. Uh, in John, John has probably the, the shortest, because in John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus simply says to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. That's not quite as detailed as Matthew's account where it says go into all the world. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it is there. Jesus thought it was, uh, God thought it was important enough, God thought it was important enough that he inspired all four gospel writers to include the commission. What are we supposed to be doing? We are supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission. <clears throat> Making disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even if we have to do it face first. <laughs> and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you, even unto the end of the world. So, now he's commissioned them. He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, a lot has been said by works people about this verse. Uh, in particular, the Church of Christ people rely heavily on this verse to substantiate their doctrine. Uh, but I use works people in general because baptism is a work. We understand baptism is a work. I'm saved. Did I do it? No. God did. Now then, it's my choice whether I'm baptized or whether I'm not. I'm in control of that. Was I in control of my salvation? No. Two different things. Baptism is a work. You either choose to follow or not. But only God can regenerate. He that believeth shall be saved. You can put uh, and is baptized in parentheses if you want to because it's, it, it, it is parenthetical. Uh, how do I know? Well, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John wrote again in chapter 5 and verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. In Acts chapter 16 verse 31 uh, Luke records Paul saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Speaking to the Philippian jailer. <clears throat> in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, again, the Apostle Paul writing says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And there are scores
scores of others that I could use, but these I think are more than sufficient. Now, it is belief or faith in Jesus Christ that is all sufficient. And even that faith is provided by God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is gift of God. Now, why is baptism mentioned here? Because baptism is the next logical step in obedience. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, he that believeth shall be saved. But if he's going to be obedient, he'll be baptized. It's the next step. Acts chapter 16, verse 33 is a good example. Philippian jailer, we used it where he said, What do I have to do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the next verses, in verse 33, it says, And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes and was baptized in all his straight way. <clears throat> Pretty plain. <laughs> baptisms. Baptisms. And it, once you're saved, baptism is the next step in obedience. <clears throat> now, without it, very simply, without it, you can never be a part of the local New Testament church, of the Lord's church. Uh, I use a, 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 a familiar Church of Christ verse again, Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> That sermon was preached right at, on the day of Pentecost, right after they had seen this miraculous working of the Holy Spirit coming on and empowering the church. And they asked, what should we do? And Peter answered, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. First you repent for the remission of sins and you're baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And by the way, I have that gift. If you're a member of this church, you have that gift. You don't speak in tongues like they did that day. But that's not what was going on. The church was being empowered. <clears throat> And this church has that same power. But God deals with us differently today because we have his written word. <clears throat> Unbelievers are condemned. Damned is the word that used, Mark used. John wrote in John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. <clears throat> Our text goes on to say in verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay <coughs> hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's verses 17 and 18. <coughs> In my name they shall cast out devils. Acts chapter 16. I'll slow down and let you read these with me if you want to. Acts chapter 16. Verse 16, starting in verse 16. And it came to pass, as they went, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. 
The same fault with Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with no tongues. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Have you heard about those people that pass the rattlesnakes around? Well, in, to begin with, I'm like Jerry Towers. I'd be standing there in line and say, where's the back door? <laughs> there ain't no back door. Where do you suppose they want a black door? <laughs> uh, occasionally you hear of someone being bit by one of those snakes. And it don't go well with them. <clears throat> uh, Acts chapter 28. Beginning in verse <clears throat> 3. <clears throat> And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook the beast off into the fire and felt no harm. They shall take up serpents. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. <clears throat> they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Acts chapter 19. Speaking of the Apostle Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases part departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So then, <coughs> what verse was that, John? 16 or 19? 19, 12. sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. <laughs> Mark skips from there straight over to the ascension. But what we see in the previous verses is that those very signs spoken of in verses 17 and 18 were fulfilled in them the apostles, and others who did not have the completed word. Now, understand me. We don't fall behind them in the fact that we don't have miracles being wrought. But they didn't fall behind us either in the fact that we have all 
of the written word, whereas they had to get it by way of prophecy. <clears throat> but verse 20 tells us very plainly, the word they preached was confirmed by signs. <clears throat> that tells me, folks, that tells me, every word in this book, every jot and every tittle has been proven. by many miraculous signs. And we have that record before us. Now, the conclusion that I want to draw is this. God has given us four <clears throat> comprehensive accounts of the Lord's earthly ministry that we might pattern our lives and our church functions accordingly. And what I would encourage us to do is this. May we ever be found seeking to follow his pattern as close as possible. You know, the, the farther we get from, the farther in time that we get from the resurrection... It seems more faded is our zeal. And we tend to say, well, that don't matter. We can, we can change this for convenience sake. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't very far down the line that, that uh, Catholicism said, you know, this point on baptism, we can change it for convenience sake and sprinkle rather than dip. And on down the line, others said, you know, we ought to change this or we ought to change that. God has given us a very distinctive pattern and we ought to we ought to humbly seek to follow it as close as possible. Let's stand to be dismissed.